Welcome to an hour of HealthMade Radio. HealthMade is a community for natural health seekers where we educate people about common health conditions and share extensive research on the most effective natural health treatments and promote legislation that protects our health freedoms. A core concept belief is in the innate intelligence and healing power of the body, and if properly supported spiritually, emotionally, and nutritionally, it can find its way back to health. HealthMade Radio will bring information from integrative health experts throughout the world. Check us out at healthmade.co. Health is what you make it. I'm Dr. Michael Carlfeld, and I will be your host. Today's guest is Dr. David Carpenter. Dr. Carpenter is a public health physician, a graduate of Harvard Medical School, and the former dean of the School of Public Health at the University at Albany. His research interests are the study of the impact on environmental exposures on human health with a special focus on the adverse effects on children. He has more than 435 peer-reviewed publications, six books, and 50 reviews and book chapters to his credit. He serves as an advisor to the World Health Organization and the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences and is a member of the Science Advisor Board of the International Joint Commission, the body that advises the governments of the U.S. and Canada on issues around the boundary waters such as the Great Lakes. In his capacity, he chairs a work group dealing with issues related to concerns over consumption of fish, where mercury is one subject of study. He is a former president and current treasurer of the Pacific Basin Consortium for Health and Environment, an international organization that coordinates activities of all the countries in the Pacific Basin around issues related to air pollution, hazardous waste, and human health consequences of exposure to contaminants. He's a co editor of the Bioinitiative Report, found at www.bioinitiative.org, a comprehensive web document on health effects of electromagnetic fields. Dr. Carpenter, it's such an honor to have you on the show today. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. Uh, the impact of, of electromagnetic fields and radio frequencies is, is becoming a, a bigger and bigger issue as we are becoming more and more reliant uh, on technology, uh, how how are we as as a normal human being? How are we exposed to these fields and radio frequencies? Where where are they all coming from? I and mean, we we can't see them, we can't taste them, we can't touch them. How are we exposed to them? Well, light evolved with some exposure to radio frequency fields because uh, they are coming from outer space. Uh, the until relatively recently. The man-made sources of radio frequency fields were primarily radio and television. If you can turn your dial, whether your radio dial or TV dial, to different stations, what you're receiving are, are electromagnetic fields of slightly different frequencies. So let me back up and explain what the electromagnetic spectrum is. The electromagnetic spectrum, electromagnetic waves are sine waves and they travel at the speed of light, but they can be at different frequencies. So our household electricity is at 60 hertz. That means 60 cycles per second. Our uh, radio and television are at megahertz, which is millions of cycles per second. And then uh, above the, the electromagnetic fields that uh, are associated with electricity and radio frequency radiation, then we have infrared radiation. This is the radiation that comes from the sun that heats the earth, without which life would be impossible. And then at slightly higher frequencies than that, we have visible light. And again, life on earth would be impossible without visible light because visible light is the, the basis of the, the generation of foodstuff through chlorophyll in plants. Above that, we have the ultraviolet radiation. And now we know that ultraviolet radiation causes skin cancer and uh, suppresses the immune system. And above even that, we have X-rays and gamma rays and cosmic rays, which are, again, these sine waves, but they have sufficient energy that they can directly damage DNA. So when we talk about the electromagnetic spectrum, it's a variety of frequencies and a variety of energies. The issue is that 
in modern life, the a magnitude of our exposure has just increased enormously uh, with the advent of cell phones, of cell towers, of Wi-Fi everywhere, of uh, smart meters on many homes. Now we're talking about driverless cars. All of that's going to be radio frequency radiation. And the concern is if there are adverse health effects, they're likely to increase dramatically because of the increased exposure that we all are experiencing. There's certain frequencies that would be beneficial that's part of that spectrum and, and certain that are, are negative. I mean, the, uh, you, you're talking about that the, the density has increased. I mean, we're exposed to more of it. But uh, if it's something that's beneficial, wouldn't more be better? And then you have a certain part of the spectrum that's detrimental that would be worse. Well, I think the beneficial aspects are entirely with the convenience that it comes by radio, television, Wi-Fi, all of these things. Uh, there have been a few uh, demonstrations of usefulness of radio frequency fields. For example, if you have a broken bone that doesn't heal with other techniques, uh, application of some patterns of radio frequency fields can actually promote bone healing. But there is no apparent, there's no evidence whatsoever that electromagnetic fields have beneficial effects uh, in the radio frequency range. Now, obviously, <clears throat> x-rays and, and ionizing radiation is very beneficial for uh, treating cancer, uh, and that's because it kills cancer cells more readily than it kills non-cancer cells. But... Uh, in spite of those beneficial uses in, in medicine, uh, there's no uh, evidence of any beneficial effect of, of uh, electromagnetic fields. So we, uh, going back to the 70s, I mean, we were exposed to a, a certain density of, of these fields, and, and now we're back, you know, now it's almost 2020. Uh, and uh, has, has the quantity of these fields have they doubled tripled i mean how much more are we exposed now compared to then i don't know that i can give you a a, a factor that's based on any hard evidence but i suspect it's the, the order of 50 times or 100 times because uh, again it hasn't been that long ago that we didn't even have radio when the only source of uh, electromagnetic fields well, when, when, we, when we developed electricity, there are magnetic and electric fields associated with electricity. And this is interesting because this is how I first got involved in the whole study of EMF. In 1979, there was a report that nobody believed, but it was published in a very prestigious scientific journal that said that children that lived in homes that had high magnetic fields coming from the power lines in the street were more likely to develop leukemia than children that did not live in those homes. When I first came to New York in 1980, I was given the responsibility of administering a research program designed to determine whether there were any hazards associated with these magnetic fields from electricity. I was very skeptical because it just didn't, again, it's something you don't see, you don't feel, and it didn't seem likely that it would be harmful. But we replicated the study that had shown the elevations in childhood leukemia, and we found a whole host of other biological effects, many of which you couldn't really translate into hazards, but biological effects from these fields that are generated by these low-frequency electromagnetic fields that are associated with electricity. And since that time, of course, there's been this rapid growth primarily in the radio frequency fields, but we still have exposures to these uh, fields coming from household, electricity, uh, power lines, uh, any of the electric devices we use. I don't believe those are the, the most dangerous hazard in our society, but there still is very good evidence that there is a hazard associated with excessive exposure to magnetic fields coming from electricity. So I'm, I'm curious, you, you mentioned that uh, you, you saw the impact of like leukemia, you know, certain types of cancer in relationship to these uh, electromagnetic frequencies caused by these power lines. But you also mentioned that there, there are some other 
biological changes that you saw that did not really be, that wasn't considered as a a hazard uh, being hazardous what what were some of those changes that you saw well we found some changes in brain activity uh things as simple as the electroencephalogram of evoked responses when you you shine a light or stimulate a nerve and record the electrical activity in the brain. Uh, almost every one of the 15 projects that we supported found some biological effect. But uh, the only one that was really of concern was the uh, evidence for elevations in cancer in children. The others were effects that now we have more information primarily from the study of the radio frequency fields. And we think, yes, they do pose a hazard, but uh, it wasn't apparent at the time that those were particularly hazardous. It did show, however, that these electromagnetic fields that we can't perceive uh, do affect the physiology of the body. Well, we're going to take a quick break. Uh, you're listening to Health Made Radio. I'm here with Dr. David Carpenter. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Health Made Radio. I'm here with Dr. David Carpenter, and we're talking about the impact of electromagnetic fields and what it does to us physiologically. Uh, Dr. Carpenter, you're mentioning that one of the things that you're seeing uh, was the changes in, in the brain uh, of people that were close to these these fields. And I'm curious, since we currently we're dealing with a, a lot of uh, I would say ADD, ADHD, anxiety, depression, all these kind of things. And obviously that is a, uh, related to an altered brain activity. Do you think that there can be a correlation between these fields that have intensified that we're more exposed to nowadays uh, to uh, these type of conditions that uh, we're dealing with more and more of? Well, I, I don't think there's any strong evidence for a relationship between electromagnetic fields, especially radio frequency fields, and ADHD or autism, in spite of other people that have made those hypotheses. But the evidence is just not there. However, the effects that we see in uh, people from exposure, primarily the radio frequency fields, because that's the exposure that's increased most, those effects are primarily effects on the brain. The big issue that I think everybody can understand is very strong evidence that excessive use of a cell phone held to your head increases the risk of brain cancer. Uh, that evidence is very, very strong, and it baffles me that government officials and the general public doesn't understand how convincing that evidence is. Now, again... Uh, brain cancer is not a, a terribly common cancer, but certain types of brain cancer, that being specifically the glioblastoma, that's the cancer that killed John McCain and Ted Kennedy and a whole a Bo Biden, a whole variety of prominent people, very rare, but very tightly associated with excessive use of cell phones. I don't mean to imply that in those particular incidents, those people use cell phones a lot. I wouldn't be surprised if they did, but I have no evidence that they did. Uh, so if, if exposure, holding a cell phone to your head and doing that a lot of hours a day increases the risk of brain cancer, this indicates that this is a serious issue. Uh, we are seeing elevations in the rates of glioblastoma across the world more dominant in developed countries, Scandinavia, the U.K., the U.S. And this is at a time when overall incidence of brain cancer appears to be going down, but not the kinds that are associated with uh, excessive use of cell phones. In addition, uh, the brain cancers appear primarily on the side of the head that one traditionally holds their cell phone. Uh, in addition to the glioblastomas and gliomas, uh, we're seeing an increase in the incidence of acoustic neuromas. This is a swan cell, a special kind of supporting cell that wraps around nerve fibers, uh, but the auditory nerve runs through a bony canal. So when it's not a cancer, but it's a tumor, and as it grows, it's in a bony canal, so it causes pain and deafness, 
and is clearly associated with uh, using a cell phone on that side of the head. Now, the real evidence that this is something that should be taken seriously are the studies that were done by the U.S. National Toxicology Program. They exposed rats to cell phone radiation for, the, for two years. I believe it was two years, basically the lifespan of the rats. And the rats developed swanomas and uh, gliomas of the brain, the same cancers we see in people. Now, if that's not enough, uh, the Ramazzini Institute in Italy did another study, very much the same as that done by the National Toxicology Program, but they applied radio frequency fields modeled after that that comes from a cell tower and exposes people that live near a cell tower. They found the same two cancers appearing in the animals. Now, one of the reasons that people have sort of dismissed the human evidence, which we've had for a number of years, is that nobody had demonstrated these cancers in animals. In the last year, that's no longer the case. So that's an effect on the brain. Now, there are other effects on the brain. Uh, and and these, there there is some evidence for impairments of learning and memory, but that's still a, an ongoing area of investigation, and and I would not consider that evidence to be very strong. But we are seeing a, a dramatic increase in the number of people that feel ill if they're exposed to high levels of radio frequency fields. It's a syndrome that we call electrohypersensitivity. And it's characterized by headache, by ringing in the ears, by a feeling of brain fog. Your brain just isn't working correctly. Uh, sometimes gastrointestinal upset, a whole variety of nonspecific sim symptoms. Now, the problem is that when these people go to their physician, they usually are referred to a psychiatrist with the idea that this is just psychological. It's clearly not just psychological. And uh, we have uh, now increasing evidence. My colleague, Dominique Belpome in Paris, now even has clinical chemistry changes that he can detect in human blood that show differences in people that show this syndrome of electrohypersensitivity as compared to people that do not. This syndrome is very similar to multiple chemical sensitivity. And we have a number of other symptom, uh, syndromes chronic fatigue, Gulf War illness, fibromyalgia. All of these are syndromes characterized by rather nonspecific symptoms, but the origin is primarily in the brain, if not exclusively in the brain. So uh, this, this really raises some major red flags because uh, you don't have to talk for long hours on a cell phone to get these exposures. And many of these exposures occur just in ordinary day-to-day -day life, but they can have severe impacts on people. In a few cases of really extreme situations, people have no longer been able to stay in cities. They've had to go to remote areas in the country. And as we increase the spread of uh, radio frequency fields and Wi-Fi everywhere, there are fewer and fewer places that people can go to escape. Uh, continued exposure to radio frequency radiation. So it seemed to me, I mean, if it has this kind of impact on these uh, hypersensitive individuals, it would mean that at, uh, for a normal individual, maybe don't, they don't experience it to the same extent, that it would still have a physiological negative impact, even though maybe their immune system, maybe their uh, nervous system is just a little bit stronger so they're not able to, uh, it doesn't exhibit as much, but maybe they just feel a bit more anxious or they are lower energy, harder time to sleep. I mean, would, would that... Well, I think that's absolutely right. And I, I, in my, my judgment, there are many people that, that uh, have these symptoms but simply have no idea what's causing their anxiety or their feeling that their brain doesn't work right. Now, again, we have some evidence from human studies that that show that uh, these things are affecting the brain. One study that I think is particularly impressive was done by uh, 
was the lead author was the director of one of the National Institutes of Health Institutes. And what she and her colleagues did was measure the metabolism of the brain. And you can do that with a, 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 a modified version of glucose. The brain uses glucose for its energy. And this is a version of glucose that can't be metabolized, so it gets into cells and then can't, can't get out, can't be broken down. And what they demonstrated in, a person, in persons that were not electrosensitive that was that if they held a cell phone to the ear that was active but muted so the person couldn't hear anything, uh, the metabolism in the parts of the brain close to that cell phone, that ear, was increased. And if the cell phone was turned off, not active, there was no change. So clearly, even in people that don't have these symptoms, there are effects on, on brain metabolism that result from holding an active cell phone to your ear. Now, there are other studies that show changes in blood flow in the brain. So, and then changes in electroencephalograms, changes in uh, some evoked responses. Uh, and these studies have primarily been done in people that do not report as being electrosensitive. Why some people would respond to this and other people would not is something we really don't understand now. But uh, we do know that there are many environmental exposures that uh, have differential effects on some people as compared to others. Well, we're going to take a quick break. Uh, you're listening to Health Made Radio. I'm here with Dr. David Carpenter. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Health Made Radio. We're discussing the impact of electromagnetic field radio frequencies. Uh, I am here with David, Dr. David Carpenter. Uh, Dr. Carpenter, you were talking about two different impacts that the frequencies had on the brain. One was that it reduced the circulation or it had an impact on the circulation. And I would assume that that meant a reduction of the circulation and also that it increased the metabolism of sugar within uh, the, uh, the brain. So I would assume that if you speed up the metabolism and reduces the flow of glucose to the cell, that the brain cells start to starve. Well, it's, uh, it's not really quite so simple. Uh, the uh, blood flow to the brain usually increases when nerve cell activity increases. <clears throat> And, and metabolism increases also when nerve cell activity increases. And then when the brain is less active, uh, then the metabolism and the blood flow can sort of go down. These are physiologic regulatory systems. But uh, the point here is that in all of us, these uh, external exposures that we don't perceive can affect critical functions of the brain. Absolutely. And, and then going a little bit deeper than we, we have then the genetic impact. I mean, have they been able to demonstrate any, any genetic impact from these radio frequencies? Well, there have been a few demonstrations that this goes back now to the, the power line frequencies. Uh, there was a study from Asia showing that the children that developed leukemia in relation to exposure from magnetic fields from electricity uh, were those that had a, a particular genetic susceptibility, a particular gene that was a little different from other people's. And this is a, this is a concept that, I, that we, have, we are finding applies to so many different environmental exposures that result in disease in some people, but not in others. That, uh, and it's, a, it's an area where we're just beginning to understand uh, that we all differ in slight ways in the genes that we have, and that uh, these, these relatively minor changes in one gene or another can make an individual much more susceptible or much less susceptible to different environmental impacts. So just because uh, not everybody develops electrohypersensitivity doesn't mean that all of our bodies aren't affected, but it may be that those individuals with certain genes are much more likely to be affected. Uh, from what I understand, I mean, um, 
and correct me if I'm wrong, is that uh, some of the bioeffect that's been uh, seen is that uh, it tends to then prevent the body from uh, or making it harder for, for the body to heal the damaged DNA. Is, is that correct? That is correct, yes. Our, our bodies have uh, many uh, mechanisms that are designed to repair DNA damage. Uh, you know, we all have DNA damage occurring every day. We all have little cancers forming every day. But our immune system and these, uh, these devices, that, these enzymes that uh, repair DNA... Uh, now, let me back up a little bit, because we think that the critical issue here is the generation of reactive oxygen species. Those are often called free radicals. And they're, they're common to many diseases. As a matter of fact, uh, one of the best documented theories of aging is that our body normally develops some of these free radicals by just our metabolism, but then all kinds of extraneous factors. Uh, these are not the ones that directly damage DNA, but they generate these reactive oxygen species, and they're reactive, so they indirectly damage DNA and cause disease. That appears to be the, the common mechanism for these health effects of uh, radio frequency fields and the, and the extra low frequency fields from, from power lines. Now, some of the best evidence for that, there are some effects that are not on the brain. Uh, there's very strong evidence that uh, men that hold a wireless laptop on their lap for a long time have reduced sperm counts. And uh, there's been a lot of study, a number of, of good studies on isolated sperm, on animals, and uh, also on humans that have shown that uh, holding a wireless laptop on your lap generates these reactive oxygen species uh, in your testes, and that impairs sperm counts. Uh, this is, of course, a concern because we know that uh, male fertility in the developing world has gone down by about 50%. And there are a variety of reasons that might explain that, but certainly one of them is one possible explanation is that there uh, has been this increasing exposure to uh, uh, electromagnetic fields that generate reactive oxygen species that directly damage the cells that generate sperm and the sperms themselves. Yeah, I heard from a talk, uh, Dr. Ole uh, Johansson, uh, that he did in, in Denmark, and he was, he was uh, addressing that very specific issue, and he said it, at the rate we're at right now in the decrease of sperm count, uh, he was talking to the Danish people that uh, uh, all of Denmark would be sterile in, in about 200-some years, uh, which I thought was pretty fascinating. <laughs> So, well, I guess I, I'm wondering if we're going to survive 200 plus years with climate change and all the other things we're doing to our climate. But uh, it, it certainly is of concern. And we certainly see uh, male infertility increasing around the globe. So uh, you were mentioning then that the, uh, the impact of, of these frequencies it decreases the reactive oxygen species, which uh, obviously uh, it... Uh, damages the DNA, and, and we know that a lot of cancerous processes are involved with you know, genetic mutations, uh, which can then cause cancer cells and, and so forth. And then at the same time, we have then a, a reduction in the repair of this DNA. So we, we have then an a increase of damage and a reduction in being able to heal the damage uh, are both of those things happening at the same time, or is it just the creation of the reactive oxygen species? Well, it's really both of them. It's a perfect storm because uh, the reactive oxygen species can damage absolutely everything, every cell, every enzyme, every protein. It isn't just the DNA. Now, the DNA uh, is of greatest concern because of its critical role in cancer, but uh, DNA is responsible. Mutations generate birth defects. Uh, there are all kinds of uh, damages to DNA that, that result in cancer and, and other things. So uh, anything that... Uh, the, the reactive oxygen species are not very specific. 
they'll damage whatever is near near them. Uh, they can break down water. That's actually how they're formed, because the uh, the water then becomes hydroxyl ion or uh, uh, an, an active oxygen species that tries it, it it just binds or acts on whatever is nearby, whether it's a protein or a DNA molecule, and so the uh, effects are negative, but they're on just about every aspect of human physiology. And uh, with that also, um, does it have an impact then on our immune system? Like a lot of people are dealing with uh, mast cell activation and, and lymphocyte activity. Uh, we're dealing with more allergies, dealing with autoimmune conditions. Uh, uh, asthmas, uh, does it seem to be a, a correlation between these frequencies and, and these type of conditions as well? Well, I don't think there's a, a, a strong body of evidence. There are some people that have actually written about effects on the immune system. You mentioned Dr. Hansen. He's one of them that has. Uh, in my judgment, that evidence is suggestive, but not, not actually definitive. But again, from what I've said, uh, Reactive oxygen species are not selective. They're going to impact immune system cells, uh, whether they're be thymocytes or T cells or B cells or whatever have you. And uh, so it's not surprising that there are effects on the immune system. Uh, in terms of the human diseases, uh, the, the three that are most obvious are cancer, effects on uh, male fertility, and then this rather nonspecific and controversial uh, syndrome of electrohypersensitivity. There are some other reports that uh, are credible, but they have not been studied to the point that I would uh, take them as being very well documented. Wonderful. And for those three, I think they're very well documented. Well, we're going to take a quick break. You're listening to HealthMate Radio. I'm here with Dr. David Carpenter. Welcome back to Health Made Radio. I'm Dr. Michael Carlfeld. I'm here with Dr. David Carpenter, and we are discussing the impact of electromagnetic frequencies and radio frequencies on uh, human health and uh, other other species health as well. Uh, so we we've, we've been talking about then the impact on the body. Are there certain groups that of uh, of the population that tend to be more vulnerable? I mean, we we mentioned the the electro hypersensitive group, but are children uh, are children more impacted? I mean, it seems because they have a, a, a more of a soft skull, uh, so I, I would assume that they would have more of an impact. Well, I think there's evidence that they do have that there is a greater impact on children. Uh, the let's again start by talking about cancer. Uh, there have been studies from Scandinavia again where uh, they've looked at use of, of uh, cell phones held to the head and development of brain cancer. And what they found is that uh, under the age of 18, there was a five times greater risk of developing brain cancer in a, in a, a, a person, a child that used cell phones than an adult that used cell phones. And furthermore, Younger adults had a greater risk than older adults, uh, and that makes some sense. Now, there have been studies, uh, uh, Professor Gandhi at the University of Utah has done these modeling studies where he's looked at the penetration of, of uh, cell phone radiation into the brains of a child and an adolescent and an adult and showed that the radio frequency radiation penetrates much more deeply into the brain of a child for two reasons. First of all, the brain is smaller. Secondly, the skull is thinner. Uh, and that makes good sense. And of course, the brain of a child is growing and developing. So it's much more vulnerable to these reactive oxygen species, which can cause damage that then can last for a lifetime. Now, uh, there's been increasing concern about uh, development of electrohypersensitivity in, ch in school-aged children. Now, I've been involved in uh, several situations where uh, a child in a school where there were 
uh, co- computer classrooms with 20, 30 kids on a wireless laptop with one big router. Uh, that makes the classroom basically a little mini microwave oven. And while most of the students are not aware of there being adverse health effects, some have developed the full-blown electrohypersensitivity syndrome. <clears throat> that is, constant headaches, inability to learn, often nausea and vomiting, and GI upset. And uh, when the ch- uh, well, in the situation I know best, the child would go to school in the morning and be fine for a couple of hours, develop a headache about noon, be desperately ill in the afternoon, go home and recover somewhat, and the next morning come back and have the th- same thing repeat. So uh, the, the other question related to that is even in those children that don't manifest this full syndrome, are their brains being affected to the point that they're not learning and remembering as well? Uh, I've done a lot of work mostly with uh, chemical exposures that have effects on, on learning and memory. And uh, what we find is that there are a whole variety of things that can re- reduce one's ability to learn. And the last place you want to have those exposures is in a school where you go to school to learn. And uh, so this has become one of my bully puppets. I think that, that uh, while there's every reason to have every child having access to the Internet, doing it with radio frequency radiation rather than wired computers is downright foolish. If you have a wired connection to your laptop, you'll have perfect access to the Internet. You will have no radio frequency exposure. Yet schools around the country are rushing to have everything wireless because it's widely viewed as being good new technology, and people seem to be oblivious to the fact that some people react very negatively to this. It's perhaps a little more convenient to have uh, routers everywhere and wireless connections than to have a wired computer classroom or wired any kind of classroom, which is not as flexible, you can't move it around, but it's much safer in terms of exposure to students, teachers, staff, custodians, uh, than having uh, radio frequency generation everywhere. Yeah, like you, you mentioned, the, the whole purpose of that environment is to initiate and support learning. And then if you then create an environment that is opposite to what you're wanting to achieve, uh, then you need to then take a, a hard look as to you know what type of priorities you should have. That's absolutely right. So if, if this uh, impact it exists then on, on young children, also I was thinking for young mothers uh, out there, mothers-to-be, I, I saw a study here where... You know, children whose mothers had used cell phones during pregnancy, that these children had 25% more emotional problems, 35% more hyperactivity, 49% more conduct, uh, conduct problems, and 34% more peer problems. So it, it, it seems to me that uh, even as a, as a mother while you're being pregnant, uh, that you really need to take this seriously as to the kind of exposure that you have with these radio frequencies. That's absolutely correct. And there is also evidence that uh, exposure of a pregnant woman can increase the risk of a child developing a brain tumor and developing leukemia in childhood. So it's, uh, it's again, one of these things uh, Certainly any woman that becomes pregnant doesn't want to harm her child. And uh, while I think the evidence for these effects on the cognitive development of the child are still a subject of uh, needing more research, there's enough evidence already for every woman to take extreme care in uh, her use of exposure to these electromagnetic fields. Is there any studies out there that have, beyond a doubt, 
proven that all these frequencies uh, from all the cell towers and everything, that they are safe? Absolutely not. Now, it's very difficult to prove something is safe, uh, but there certainly is no study that has proven these fields to be safe. On the other hand, there have been thousands of studies that have shown that these fields cause biological effects, and many of those studies certainly show beyond any question of a doubt that that exposure causes harm. And uh, with that, then, uh, would it be... I, I, those studies have proven that there's harm. Are these just kind of fly-by-night studies? Because a lot of people say, well, it hasn't really been proven, and it's just kind of a low-level study. Uh, is, is that the kind of studies we're dealing with, or are these hard evidence studies that prove that they cause harm? Well, uh, there's always some of both. You know, an area like this that's controversial sometimes attracts uh, less high-quality scientists, and so there's a lot of nonsense that's in the literature there. But the evidence in excellent studies done in the best peer-reviewed scientific journals, if you discount those that are uh, less, less reliable, that evidence is still totally uh, definitive showing harm. Uh, I, it's unfortunate that that sometimes uh, you have that that uh, latch on to an issue that is debatable and publish things that sort of brings discredit on the whole field. But uh, I tend to ignore that, which is why I, I also tend to try to limit the diseases that I talk about as being associated to those that have been studied by quality scientists published in the very best scientific journals for which I see the evidence as being definitive. And uh, one thing that I was thought interesting, I know when you know, you have people are trying to sue the, uh, uh, the cell phone companies in regards to the negative impact on, on their body if they've been impacting in a negative way. Uh, and from my understanding is that uh, the cell phone companies uh, in the manual and instruction is that uh, the cell phones uh, as they need to be held at least one inch away from the body at all times uh, what, what was your what's your take on that is that something that you've heard as well well i know that to be true uh, i actually testified it to the state legislature in in maine and uh um, one of my colleagues made that point and showed us all in the fine print, in the manual to the cell phone, uh, I think it said, uh, hold it at least two centimeters away from your head, which is a little less than an inch. Now, there can be two reasons for that. Uh, one, it may well be that the cell phone companies understand that there's a risk of developing cancer and they're trying to protect you from developing brain cancer. Uh, the more cynical uh, reason is that they expect there are going to be brain cancers that result from using your cell phone too much, and they want to be able to say, well, it's your fault because we told you not to hold it right up to your head. Uh, whatever the reason is, that's a very good piece of advice. The frequencies, the exposure that comes from any source of generation of radio frequency falls off quite dramatically with distance. And if you hold your cell phone an inch away from your ear, the exposure to brain, your brain is dramatically reduced. Now, it's reduced even more if you use a wired earpiece. Now, if you use a Bluetooth but put your cell phone in your pocket or on your belt, then you get some exposure to your head, but much less because the radio frequency generation is only from your phone to your ear. However, you're exposing your pelvis, and nobody's really done those studies yet showing elevations in prostate and GI cancers. There are studies now that have reported that women that wear their active cell phone in their bra have an elevated risk of breast cancer. And I was quite horrified to see my daughter uh, put her cell phone in her bra. Uh, she's a, a horse veterinarian, and 
She says, I need my hands, but I need to have access to my phone. I've shown her the papers that, that document elevations in breast cancer and women that, that uh, use their bra as a place to stash their cell phone while they're busy doing things. Sounds pretty uncomfortable to me, but in addition to being uncomfortable, it's clearly dangerous. Well, uh, Dr. Carpenter, it's been such an honor having you on the show uh, today. Uh, and I know this is such a hot topic, and especially with the... Uh, actually, one more question, if you don't mind. What do you see uh, the impact of 5G? Uh, what, what, what do you foresee? What kind of impact will that have on us? Well, it's a complicated question. Uh, the... What we hear about now as 5G is really not 5G. The real 5G are these millimeter waves. They're a much higher frequency. They're really above 20 gigahertz. Now, what we're seeing in the short term is some mixture of 4G and 5G, which is uh, in the low gigahertz range of frequencies. Uh, this is, poses major danger to people because the higher frequency waves don't travel as far, and therefore they're putting these little mini cell towers in every street in the U.S. in front of about every sixth or eighth house. And it's going to mean that you're going to be continuously exposed as you walk down every sidewalk. Now, if it were only 5G, the 5G radiation, the higher than 20 gigahertz, may not penetrate the body to the degree that the cell phone that we have now does. It will certainly impact the skin, and one would be concerned about elevations in skin cancer and that sort of thing. But the, what's being implemented today is enormously dangerous because it's going to increase the 4G exposure as well as some of the lower uh, elevated frequencies that are now being called 5G but really aren't. So I'm very concerned about it. I think we're rushing headlong into doing something without adequate thought and care and research to determine what the health effects may be. And and what and I I know that these this is just speculation from your side, but what what would you perceive? I mean, with with all the knowledge about uh, the impact of these frequencies. Uh, what kind of changes would you postulate would take place in, in our health, in our uh, mentality, emotional well-being, and so forth? Well, I would certainly anticipate that we'll see increases in the, in the risk of cancer. Now, I've talked primarily about brain cancer and leukemia, but there's evidence for other kinds of cancers uh, related to exposure as well. I would certainly expect we'll see a much increased incidence of the electrohypersensitivity, a continued decline in male fertility. And I'm very concerned, although I think the evidence still is fairly uh, weak, that we're going to see these effects on learning and memory and cognition, uh, even in people that don't show the full electrohypersensitivity syndrome. And our, our brain, our memory, our ability to think is absolutely critical to what makes a human a human. And we should not in any way compromise that. Well, thank you. Very well said. Uh, that is it for, day, uh, for today. Uh, you're listening to HealthMade Radio. Remember to check us out at healthmade.co.